We're very lucky to have two guests with us this afternoon. Dr. Azra Raza is the Chan Soon Cheong Professor of Medicine and the Director of the My Myelodysplastic Syndrome Center at Columbia University. Her breakthrough research on myeloid leukemia has defined modern understanding of the disease and has earned her recognition worldwide. Dr. Raza was a Hope Funds for Cancer Research honoree in 2012, and she received the Distinguished Services in the Field of Research in the Clinical Medicine Award from Dow Medical College in 2014. She's also the namesake of the Dr. Azra Raza Scholarship Award at her secondary school, alma mater, Islamabad Model College for Girls. She's here with us this evening to discuss her newest book, The First Cell and the Human Costs of Pursuing Cancer to the Last. In it, she explores the status quo for cancer treatment in the U.S., namely expensive and painful treatment that usually doesn't give patients more than a couple extra months to live. And she discusses how a shift in resources to early detection and prevention may allow us to make far more progress against the disease. The book has already received a lot of press for its extensive research and its argument, which, according to Kirkus Reviews, is informed by intelligence, empathy, and optimism. Dr. Raza will be in conversation this evening with her niece, Dr. Zainab Beams, a pediatrician practicing in Columbia, Maryland. She's also the creator of Rubik's Mental Health Podcast, which discusses a new preventative mental health tool of her own creation. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Azra Raza and Dr. Zainab Beams. Are we using these? Yes. yes. Are they on? OK, cool. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm Zana Beams. And again, this is Dr. Raza. And we're really excited to speak with you tonight about the first cell. So uh, full disclosure, this is my aunt. <laughs> uh, so I might accidentally call her different names. So forgive me. Uh, anyway, so. Um, the book is really uh, a really powerful book because not only does it give everybody an introduction to basic cancer research and patient care, which is an unusual combination in a provider, but it's also a call to action. It's a call to action for all of us to do better by our patients if we're providers and to do better as a society in coming up with better treatments for our loved ones and ourselves. So. I would like for you first to read to us a little bit from the book so we can get an idea what, um, what kind of a discussion it is, and then I'll ask you a few questions. Thank you, Z. Thank you, Ariana, and uh, the bookstore, Politics and Prose. What an honor to be here for me. And thanks to all of you for coming. Um, it's a very rainy and uh, wet day, and I really appreciate the effort that you've taken to come. I'll begin by reading something that I absolutely love by Emily Dickinson. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they bore it long or did it just begin? I cannot find the date of mine. It's been so long a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try and whether could they choose between they would not rather die. Z, I feel like Dickinson is speaking to me directly when she wrote these lines. I came to this country in 1977, fresh out of medical school, started working at a cancer center, and started studying and treating acute myeloid leukemia. This is a particularly deadly form of bone marrow cancers. In 1977, I was treating patients with AML, acute myeloid leukemia, with two drugs popularly known as 7 and 3 because it's 7 days of one, 3 days of the other. Today in 2019, I'm still treating AML with 7 and 3. With the same dreadful results. So the question I'm asking is, 
why after billions of dollars spent in research and over 4 million papers published on the subject of cancer, are we still using the same slash poison and burn approach? Why haven't we done better? And what is the step forward? For sure, cancer is a very complicated issue. It's a moving target. Every time a cancer cell divides into two, it picks up new mutations. So it becomes potentially a new cancer. So within a cancer, there are hundreds of thousands of potential new cancers sitting there. And no sooner do you target and kill one, the next one will wear its ugly head and expand its population and become the dominant clone. So it's not an easy thing. And that's why hundreds of thousands of researchers working in the field have still to come up with something that offers an alternative to this kind of chemotherapy and radiation therapy and surgery. Everyone knows that the best news you get once there is a diagnosis of cancer is, oh, it's early. It was detected early, so they could take care of it. So if early detection is the surest way to cure, then what they have been saying is, since 1903, that it's not the cancer that kills, but the delay in treatment that kills. So what attempts can we make to diagnose this disease early. In the last 50 years, there has been a drop in deaths from cancer by 26%. And that is something to celebrate. 26% decreased mortality from cancer. Most of, uh, most of it happened because campaigns against smoking and early detection by things like mammography, PSA, pap smears, colonoscopy. It's not because we are so wonderful we developed something new to treat cancer. Yes, there are a few advances. I'm not saying there's nothing. And even learning to use the existing strategies like chemotherapy better has improved survival, sure. But certainly we can do better than this. So I'd, I chose a section from my book to read today which kind of gives us the path forward. Before I read, I want to say one other thing, which is that some of you in this audience may have cancer now. Some of you may have had it before. And some of you have somebody who you love has had cancer. All of us are just about one degree of separation from a cancer patient at most now. Please don't feel scared. This is not a doom and gloom book. In fact, this is a forward-looking, optimistic book. But in order to reach that level of optimism and looking forward and convincing everybody to give up the sclerotic old ways of doing things, what I did is I looked at the issue from the prism of human anguish. What does a cancer patient go through in all of its granularity until we realize how much pain we are inflicting on people, we won't be able to move forward. So here is the section I chose to read this evening. Imagine a machine that automatically images your entire body while you are in your morning shower or a smart bra that has 200 tiny biosensors built in to monitor micro alterations in temperature and texture, worn for, worn for an hour a week. It generates sufficient data on an accompanying app to show distortions created by the presence of very few cancer cells. Or taking a pill whose contents are absorbed preferentially by cancer cells, excreted in the urine and detected by a fit loo or receiving a cocktail of reported genes whose protein products can be imaged with handheld devices to pinpoint cancer cells anywhere in the body. 
How about yelling at a cancer using ultrasound, compelling it to reveal its presence and its lethal potential as the tumor is forced to shed more markers into the blood when hit by waves at the right frequency? Or exhale deeply into a device that accurately recognizes the earliest footprints of cancer? Or simply prick your finger periodically to provide a drop of blood to a magneto nano sensor that identifies surrogate markers of malignancy instantly. The above are not scenes from the fantastic voyage. These are real life technologies in various stages of development today, heralding the dawn of a new era in cancer research. Here is one scenario for the future. Everyone from birth to death is regularly screened for the appearance of cancer cells in the body. Once detected, protein markers would be identified, providing a zip code for the cancer cells. A tube of blood from the individual would be obtained. T cells would be isolated, activated, armed with the address for the cancer based upon the unique protein barcode and the RNA signature it expressed. The CAR T's can be injected back into the individual to seek out and kill every cell with that address. None of the toxic effects seen with the present CAR T therapies would be an issue because the tumor mass would be minuscule compared to what we are targeting now at end stage disease. Eventually, we should not even have to draw blood for screening. Rather, every infant would be fitted with an implantable tiny device at birth that would constantly monitor for such a mishap send signals in a timely manner so that confirmation, validation, and treatment could swiftly follow. The ideal is to find every cancer at the precancerous stage through perturbations in disease-prone networks detected via dynamic monitoring by implanted devices. To detect the first cancer cell's footprints, a map of early biologic markers of cancer have to be constructed. This is what our resources should be targeting. Thankfully, the race has already begun. We will all benefit from cooperation at the deepest level. Heed the advice of an anonymous sage who said, if you want to be incrementally better, be competitive. If you want to be exponentially better, be cooperative. Thank you. Again, a call to action. So as I mentioned, I really see this book as a call to action for all of us to do better by both our patients, our families, and our scientific community. And so the first question I want to ask you, the first question I want to ask you tonight is as patients, survivors, and family members and loved ones of patients and survivors, what can we do to better push our providers and our scientific community to move in the direction that you're imploring us in which to move? Z, that's a very good question, and I would expect that from you being so politically and socially conscious as you are. Uh, I think that all of us have a stake in this. Our future is at, is at stake, our health is at stake, our next generations are at stake. One small example is that today, in this country, 42.4% individuals, 42% people who are diagnosed with cancer become completely financially ruined after two years. 42% people in the country lose every penny of their life savings and very few are cured. Even for this affluent nation, it's an untenable, unsupportable situation. Clearly, we all have to step up and do something. It's, we have tried one strategy for 50 years, which is try and kill every last cancer cell in the body. Ensure that is 
curing 68% of cancers diagnosed today, mostly because they are diagnosed earlier and earlier. But if you look at patients who have advanced disease, then the results are the same that they were 50 years ago. If somebody is diagnosed with advanced pancreatic cancer today, their chances of survival are the same as they were in 1965. So the idea is, yes, everyone realizes early detection is better. But everyone's talking about early detection using those gross techniques of screening I mentioned, which were done on an annual basis. Mammography, PSA, colonoscopy, pap smears. What I am asking is, let's stop doing these periodic health checks. Let's treat the human body as a machine and constantly monitor it. And no age group is immune from cancer. It happens in children. The book has a 22-year-old, my daughter's best friend, who suffered from cancer. So this means from birth we have to start screening people constantly for the appearance of cancer. And this is the way entire healthcare system is going to go, prevention rather than treatment and cure. What disease have we cured? Have we cured diabetes, stroke, any neurologic disease? No, we just learn to control it. Cardiac mortality has gone down dramatically because they were smarter than oncologists. They diagnose coronary uh, problems earlier and fix it. So, how can you help? How can the public help in trying to divert funds from going to develop drugs that increase survival by a mere two or three months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and are useless for 80% of the patients, even at that level, only 20 to 30% patients say with any drug respond at all, so all those billions of dollars being spent there need to be diverted, at least some of them, towards earlier detection. Now, all these things I read out to you are in various stages of development, but what we need are more resources. So capitalism actually becomes very helpful here, Z, because as long as we identify a goal, and if the goal is early detection, development of latest technology to find the footprints of cancer cells, that's the goal. If we now financially incentivize it, you can see how many people will be rushing towards it. Many people ask me, Dr. Raza, aren't you afraid that the pharmaceutical company will get very upset with you because you are basically attacking their paychecks? And my answer is no, because right now the pharmaceutical company has only the cancer patients as their clients. But if I'm asking for prevention and monitoring of healthy individuals, that means the whole country becomes their subjects and clients. So financial incentivization, a clear-cut goal, and public pressure for doing... It's not like we lack money in this country. The amount of money going into cancer research is unprecedented. The point I'm making is it's got to change directions a little now. And that will only happen with public pressure. How will that occur? I think awareness, education. There seems to be a false impression in the public that things are really progressing in cancer treatment. They're not. And so, become aware of it. Become aware that even if you don't have cancer today, you have a 50% chance of getting it tomorrow. How are you going to detect the first cell? So, I don't know if it escapes any of us that it's October, which means it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And it occurs to me that the impact of the movement that began in the 80s to improve breast cancer identification and treatment was a public pressure movement started by one woman. And so that's an ex incredibly successful example of exactly what you're saying. So if anyone in here needs a cause, 
This is a good one. Early detection of other all cancers, not just breast cancer. It's the right month to be thinking about it. And so similarly, you mentioned that nobody is immune to cancer. I'm a pediatrician, so I take care of children from birth into adulthood, and I've certainly taken care of my share of children with cancer. And uh, it's no surprise to me or mystery to me that uh, we have to do better by by uh, our patients. Thinking back on the kids that I did take care of in pediatrics, we become very, very connected to our our patients and their families when they're diagnosed with a cancer. And we are passionate in a what I see as a singular way about ensuring early detection as well as optimal care of their concerns during treatment and after treatment. And so uh, what I want to ask you about as a provider now is what can we as providers, I know there are many physicians and future physicians in the audience here, what can we do to make sure that our current and future patients and their families have a better experience or don't get cancer in the first place? I'm not sure about uh, uh, what you as a provider so, can do for so, children. So similar, mm. similar to the question about as patients, what can we do to push society in the right direction? We providers are trusted advisors. So what can we do to make sure that our patients and their families have less likelihood of getting cancer in the first place or more likelihood of being diagnosed in a more appropriate manner and then cared for in a more appropriate manner? I mean, the answer to the former is, of course, healthy lifestyles is very important. Uh, good eating, good exercise habits, and all of those things. But for the latter, how do you diagnose early? I think you need serious research. You just do. We can't get away without rigorous scientific work. That has to be supported, and there is enough support, support for it. I think that we can uh, uh, really catalyze and accelerate things dramatically if we start uh, focusing on the right questions. And so I'm very optimistic that this will happen. And in fact, I'm very confident that once the public realizes where the field has come, I think that there will be a lot of pressure on wanting to do things uh, 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 very dramatically. You know, an analogy that occurs to me, which is scientifically incorrect, but makes the point, is that if you take a frog and you throw it in boiling water, the frog will jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and very slowly start to heat it, the water will come to a boil and the frog will still not jump out because it becomes desensitized so slowly. And we have sort of as a society and as providers reached that point where I still have to meet an oncologist in all these years in my career who didn't care about the patients. All my colleagues are working so hard and they are so engaged and involved in trying to help their patients. So it isn't that. Researchers the same way, working day and night to find the right answer. But we are not looking at the whole picture, at what we are doing. The way, let's say, somebody gets diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, we have uh, the first-line therapy, which key opinion leaders in the field have decided should be a combination of these four drugs. Then if the patient responds, good. When the patient stops, res stops responding, we go to second line, third line, and then hospice. And so all the oncologists will follow this formula, first line, second line, third line, hospice. But we are not asking ourselves uh, as a whole, why are we doing this? Why are we giving first, second, and third line therapies which only are going to cause immense toxicity and whatever uh, 15, 16 months the patient has left to live will be spent in fighting off these toxicities of expensive drugs and ruin them financially. We just are not asking these questions. We're just blindly doing all these things. So I think uh, as providers, we need to become aware of 
the absurd level we have reached, are we doing the right things by our patients? And I criticize myself. You will see in the book that patient after patient, when I'm faced with them, I have to offer the choices because if I don't, I will be in jail. There is what is expected of me. So I think awareness and education and, and knowing that, okay, this is a hopeless thing. Instead of being given these statistics that 20% chance you'll improve, but improve for what, two months, 20% patients? At what physical cost? These are very profound, important questions that need to be asked to give proper advice to patients. See. That's helpful. Um, speaking now of the toxicities and challenges that uh, patients experience when they're undergoing this kind of thing, uh, a more difficult topic coming up here. So uh, I was a medical student when your husband, Dr. Harvey Preisler, was going through his own battle with cancer. And you and he went through that with an incredible deal of grace and courage, so much so that while I did know what was occurring, I didn't know quite as much as I actually learned from reading the book. And so I want to ask you what strategies you used firsthand uh, to get through that and what we can learn from you and Dr. Preisler about how to brave this kind of situation and what kinds of decision-making approaches you both used in that experience. You can reject the question if you want to. <laughs> um, I want to say that in addition to Z, my nephew JB, her husband is here, and he was, uh, both Z and JB were with me every step of the way until the last day of Harvey's death. I'll give you one little uh, incident that happened. After Harvey died, we were following a four and a half year long battle with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. My daughter was only four when he was diagnosed and eight when he died. So like three weeks later, Shahrazad, my daughter, got very sick with some flu or something. And uh, her asthma flared up and she had high fever, so she was pretty sick, but slowly she started to improve. And five, six days later, one morning, I was sitting and working in the living room and she woke up in the morning and came out crying hysterically. I was sure that something terrible has happened. She has relapsed, she's feeling worse. So I kept asking what's wrong with her and she couldn't even respond for a while. Once she was able to speak, she said, Mommy, actually, I'm feeling fine now. But now I know how terrible it is to be sick and how good it feels to get better. And my dad never got better. An eight-year-old is identifying with the suffering of a cancer patient. There is no respite. I don't have a simple formula to give about how we handled this. It's a dizzying, disorienting experience to have a small child and to know you are dying because Harvey was head of the cancer center at the university. He was not someone who could be deluded. He was not someone who could be given false hope. There is no answer, but his acceptance was almost saintly. And that is the kind of lonely courage that I see in my cancer patients day after day. This is the courage to which nations should be building monuments. I don't have an answer, Z. 
well, you took care of all of us by being so brave about it. And I think that's that's one of the answers, is that you you cared not only for each other, but you also showed a great deal of care for everyone around you by always putting your best foot, feet forward. So we're going to talk forward now. Uh, so um, there are a few people again here tonight who have been your mentees, who you've mentored as scientists and physicians. I'm one of them. And uh, we have all helped in the research that your uh, lab and your team have been doing for decades. And uh, we've all helped obtain tissue samples to help your patients. So one of the special things about the research that this team does is what I like to call bench to bedside research. So what happens is once you're diagnosed with one of the cancers that her team works on, uh, you go through a series of bone marrow biopsies and other evaluations that are then used to more personally tailor your care to your specific cancer. So it's not very fun. I've done bone marrow biopsies on a lot of children myself, and uh, it's, it's very difficult for the patient, but it's really useful in getting a lot of information about the individual disease that that person has. It's also very useful in providing information for research purposes, and this has been going on now for decades. So I want you to tell us about the very unique bank of tissue samples that your team has been collecting and what kind of a tool this bank of tissue samples can provide for us to use going forward to create the kinds of solutions that you're talking about today. So we're going to end on a very forward thinking and optimistic note about what we can do going forward. Thank you, Z. That is a very important question for me. So as I said, I started by studying and treating acute myeloid leukemia in 1977. By 1984, I knew that in my lifetime, this disease will not be cured. It is so complicated and so vicious. So I turned my attention to the only way I knew how to help patients diagnose them early which means try to catch the leukemia at a pre-leukemia stage. The idea was that if we, die, we catch these patients before they develop frank and uh, this malevolent kind of disease, maybe it will be easier to treat. So that's what myelodysplastic syndromes are. They are pre-leukemic states and a third of the patients do develop leukemia. Now at this point, it really helped me to be an immigrant. You know why? Because had I gone to school in this country, when I decided to study pre-leukemia, I would have tried to make an animal model of this disease to study it. But I was a naive 20-something from Pakistan, and I didn't know any better. And I said, if I'm going to study patients, let me save their cells. And I just started putting all this, uh, every time I did a bone marrow and drew blood, I would bank the sample. And this continued, started in 1984. Today, it is the largest tissue repository in the country dedicated to this. Not a single cell has come from another physician. To this day, I do five to 10 bone marrows on every clinic day with my own hands. And I have only met a handful of patients in all these years who refused this painful procedure. Every patient I requested from agrees and says, Dr. Raza, if it's going to help other patients, I'm willing to go through it. That is such a humbling experience. So I have amassed this tissue bank. Where's my solution? I have been working on early detection for 35 years. Why don't I have an answer? And this is what literally keeps me up at night because in science, things go in fashionable cycles. So first in the 1970s and 80s, we were looking for oncogenes. In the 1990s, we were looking to choke off blood circulation to the tumors, angiogenesis and anti-angiogenic therapies. 
Then we started waiting for the human genome project to be completed because we basically pinned all our hopes on finding the right mutations and developing the right drugs to target them. So it isn't like we were lazy and not working, but we were trying to use all the available techniques. Well, the Human Genome Project came and went, and this has been now 20 years. And we are no better. Why? Because we have found that it's, instead of having one genetic mutation we could target with one drug, there are hundreds in every, patient, uh, every tumor, and they are dynamic, moving, mutating, transforming cells. They keep changing every time they divide. So it's just impossible to keep up with them. It's, uh, it's, we have to develop a new kind of technology now to go after the first cell. So I have all this tissue repository, which I am reaching the end of my career. I have worked 35 years to save every sample doing these marrows. It costs, just maintenance of the tissue repository costs a million dollars a year. No one gives that money, no government agency, no grant. Do you know who supports me? Patients. Patients always want to give me money or support me in any way, and I tell them, no, I don't need any personal money, just give it to my research and tissue repository. So we hold fundraisers for it, and my patients support it, and some benefactors support it. And this is how we are maintaining, now the time has come that technology is ripe. Proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, panomics. Then these devices we can build, imaging and scanning and implantable devices. I'm working with biomedical engineers at Columbia University. We, uh, Sam Sia, who I'm working with, has already the M chip approved by FDA. Men can simply prick their finger once a year, once a month, drop one uh, drop of blood onto this M chip and read it with a little device at home, their PSA level, and monitor themselves. So this is the kind of thing we are developing. We are working now on implantable devices that will go under the skin to catch, image, and release cells constantly. The idea is, if we can study these tissue samples of patients who traverse the distance from pre-leukemia longitudinally towards acute leukemia, then we will have an idea about what were the first footprints of the disease. Once we know that, we can look at, for example, what were the genetic makeup of this individual who got a kind of pre-leukemia with a damage to chromosome 5. It was this polymorphism. Then we can go to healthy populations, look for that polymorphism and say, this is the person at high risk of getting a chromosome 5 kind of MDS. This is how we keep moving things back from acute leukemia to pre-leukemia to healthy individuals. But just to give you an example, in order to study 200 samples, just 200 from these thousands and thousands of samples, to study 200 patients, uh, samples at uh, patients at pre-leukemia and leukemia, just two stages, properly with the four kinds of panomics, four and a half million dollars, just for 200 samples. So to study thousands of samples, at least a hundred million dollars. What is a hundred million dollars in this country? A football player or coach gets that much money to play ball and we can't give that kind of money to cure cancer. I think that this is a very important issue for, and this is why I've written the book, that people have to realize where the money should be going. It isn't lack of money in the country. This is the most affluent country in the world. Cancer is not happening to someone else. It's happening to all of us. So it's in everyone's interest to be doing this. And my solution is only for pre-leukemia and leukemia and looking at, but, the same principles can be applied to everything. So a kind of barcode of proteins can be developed, which will say pancreatic cancer susceptibility to lung cancer susceptibility to ovarian cancer susceptibility to leukemia. These are the footprints of each. And imagine doing just that simple test then. But this is how rigorous science has to be conducted on human samples, not on mice and not on other animals, but on human tissue. And that's what makes us unique, that you helped 
your son who has watched me do bone marrows and holds hands of patients i'm doing bone marrows on sam is here uh, this is what uh, what is so important and so critical is to focus on humans and we will find the answer i am completely confident that the answers are lying frozen right now in those freezers at columbia university we just have to thaw them out and study them properly let's unfreeze them <laughs> <laughs> thank you so we have time for questions and uh uh, we were t asked to use micro the microphones, so perfect. Okay, so there's a microphone here. Sorry, it's all twisted. Are you gonna do our first? Ask our first question. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a primary care physician. My sister is a GI oncologist at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Uh, two things. First of all, there are some things that some people consider worse than cancer. Uh, I would say dementia. If I had to choose, you know, and nobody gets out of here alive, uh, I would take cancer any day. Second, as I'm sure you know, there's lots of concern about over-treatment that comes from screening. So you have some cancers that are indolent. Um, prostate cancer often but is, but not always, but we haven't figured out how to distinguish the aggressive ones from the indolent ones, which are the large majority, and people say that men don't, most men don't die from prostate cancer, they die with prostate cancer. And there's concern that a lot of people are getting treated whose cancer would never advance. Um, and that's a problem too. So the earlier we start, the more likely it is that we're going to pick up cancers that would not progress and treat people who want to be treated who don't need it. Thank you very much, uh, doctor. I'm very grateful for this question because this is the pet criticism of everyone, right. overdiagnosis, overtreatment. Right. So I'm not saying that we find the first cell and we go blindly like... Uh, uh, these cavalier uh, cowboys and attack no what i'm saying is that once you find the cell what you have to do is look at 20 other tests before you decide it's an aggressive life-threatening kind of uh, thing before you attack it so for example when a cancer starts it starts to divide rapidly because it divides faster than normal cells in order to divide, it will uh, make new blood vessels. That makes the area hot. Right. You go to sleep at night with bed sheets that scan you for the appearance of a hot area. Let's say we diagnose, oh, in Azra Raza's pancreas, we detected a hot area today in the tail of the pancreas. You don't go in and start taking out the pancreas tail immediately. Then you do 20 other tests. Look at the biomarkers that are associated with pancreatic cancer in blood and urine and saliva and stool and everywhere you can. You follow that area for a while and with proper identification of biomarkers, we expect to distinguish between aggressive versus potentially uh, smoldering kind of cancers. Of course, we are going to have to do all that through science. This is what I'm asking to do. If you give me examples of prostate cancer being diagnosed today and some men were diagnosed at 83 with a prostate cancer that won't kill them for 30 years, then what's the point of doing a radical prostatectomy and making them into uh, having physical dis uh, dysfunction? No. Absolutely, I agree with you, but those are very gross old techniques. I'm asking for research to develop molecular markers and the latest cutting edge technology to define lethality so that we understand what we are doing and do it properly, but just do it early. 
Thank you for bringing up the concept of screening and helping us clarify that because that isn't one that we all think about in the same way. You know, physicians and the oh sure think about it differently. Um, I I love that you're having to clarify this because uh, Dr. Preisler was a big fan of science fiction literature, <laughs> and I am not a big reader of science fiction literature. But it took me a little while to understand that he read those kinds of books because he was thinking like that. And so are you. So you're thinking in, in way, way, way ahead. And I think it's great to be able to hear your clarification of how forward thinking those ideas are. We have mics on both sides of the room here. So I'm going to help us tr um, go side to side. Does this go work? ahead. Yep. Does that work? Yep. Oh, okay. uh, I detect a Nobel Prize in the making. Oh. So. <laughs> So um, I had just listened to a program recently mentioning about on top of the heart is a gland that produces these T cells. And you mentioned about T cells. And it talked about a study of these bicyclists. I'm, it might have been in Northern Europe that were, um, you know, 40 years, 50 years have been doing this thing. And so they found out that their T cell production from this gland or whatever is like that of a 20 year old and just steady, 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 as opposed to typically it declines and declines and declines slowly. So it sounded like exercise was a, a helpful element in that. But anyway, I was just curious about more about T cells. My brother's head of pharmacology, Michigan State. I just eat good food. I don't know anything about medicine. So could you just talk about T cells or other forms of preventive or, or attacking, you, you know, utility. Thank you. Uh, I wish you had just stopped after your first sentence. Okay. <laughs> I like that the most. Okay. <laughs> no. Meaning I have uh, a Nobel Prize in the making. Okay, good. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so how about the T cells? T cells are just one form of, uh, one arm of the immune system that attacks uh, foreign, uh, when it detects something abnormal. And... Uh, Washington is the place where uh, careers have been made over the last 50 years in, this, uh, in, in exploration and investigation uh, of functioning of T cells. And believe me, every time we go in, we find a new subset of T cells, T3 cells, T4 cells, T pan T uh, cells. So, Human body, nature, it's all so complicated. No sooner do we think we understand it that new areas of complications open. So it's hard for me to give you a packaged bullet kind of answer about T cells because it's an extremely complicated issue. But it is something that we are trying to harness in the service of fighting the cancer uh, within the patient's body by making the T cells more focused and target more onto the tumor by putting an address of the tumor onto the T cells and then releasing them into the patient's body to go and uh, seek out the cell it has to kill. Uh, and is the T cells part of the immune system? Yes. And what And how big a part of the immune system is that? A big... I don't think we know right now because the immune system is also an evolving story. But it is a very important part in the fight against cancer, yes. And there are some wonder, uh, there is a wonderful article by my colleague, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. He and I share a lab. He got the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Emperor of All Maladies. Sid Mukherjee is one of the smartest scientists in the country, besides being a great writer. And he just had a... And a, and a singer, not a musician. And he just had a beautiful article in the New Yorker on the CAR T, the T cells, how we are using, I think just two months ago. Uh -huh. So please look up that New Yorker article, which I think is a piece of art by itself. It's Dr. a beautiful Rogan. Mukherjee. Okay, thank you. A specific question about uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. Besides the genetic mutation, uh, are there good means to predict the course? Because I hear it's sometimes pretty well downhill over a few years, and some people remain very stable and even have increase in platelets or neurophils. Thank you for asking that question. So this is the disease I have dedicated yeah. my life to study for 35 years. And to this day, the only way to accurately predict the natural history of the disease in an individual patient, 
You see, we use statistics like 30% patients will die within six months, 30% will die in five years, and 30% will be alive at 20 years. But when you're sitting across a table with an individual patient, how do you apply that statistic to the individual? It's not easy. We try, we have developed all these algorithms and scoring systems to devise, but in the final analysis, the only certain way of prognostication is to follow the disease in the individual patient themselves and see, is it an aggressive disease? Are they dropping their counts? Are blasts appearing rapidly? Are there mutations happening? Are the chromosomes getting more and more damaged? Because I can't apply a statistical number to an individual, and that remains a problem. Hi. Uh, I'm a physician. I <coughs> study the financial barriers to use of health services in the United States. Uh, people who are chronically ill, and very dramatically, the figure you used, 40% of people with cancer ending up <coughs> bankrupting themselves, their children, their spouse. Uh, I have some problem in understanding why physicians, <coughs> oncologists, uh, can't do a better job uh, <clears throat> of meeting their professional responsibility to do what they can with their technology, but simultaneously uh, be aware of and sensitive to the devastating impact of providing everything for everyone. So I'd like to uh, understand better from you uh, the conflict between uh, the ethics of medicine uh, and the eth ethics of a compassionate physician uh, with their responsibility to their patient. Thank you so much for asking again, doctor, because I could not agree with you more. It is a fundamentally ethical issue of what we are doing today and why are we being made to do it. Uh, you see, most of the decisions I make for my patients are not being made by me. They are made by a group of key opinion leaders who have directives sent out that this is how you have to treat a lower risk MDS patient. This is how you have to treat a higher risk MDS. If I don't do that now, I'm opening myself to legal challenges. So the system in this country has evolved in such a way that it serves everybody except the patient. And that's what I'm challenging. This is why the book has been actually written, to ask these very, very prime evil questions about why have we reached this absurd point and what can we do to change it. But thank you for bringing it up. It's something that is that I find really viscerally upsetting. In fact, the, the book showcases a few patient stories and allows them to tell their own experiences and, and does give you the ability to understand the complexity of the conversations and sometimes the inadequacy of the conversations. See, one thing I want to add to the question that was asked by the primary care physician is a very important question. And I just wanted to add to it that Every new solution that we bring to a problem has its own set of problems. So I'm not going to sit here and declare that I have all the answers, I'm Miss Wonderful, I have blah, blah. No, I think that even with early detection, we are going to meet serious challenges. We have to be prepared to deal with them. My call, as you called it, the clarion call in your introduction, my call is that we are, it's not like we are not seeing a solution. My problem is we are not even seeing the problem clearly. At least I'm pointing out in no uncertain term, terms, in completely uncompromising language, where the field is and what is wrong with it right now. I may not have all the solutions for the future, yes, but I'm saying that enough is enough. We have tried this strategy going after the last cell for half a century, and all we have ended up is ruining patients, ruining families, physically, financially, converting cancer into a business rather than an, a, a, a disease that is such a devastating thing to have. So. 
please don't leave this room thinking I'm Miss Wonderful and I have all the answers. I don't. I'm pointing to the problem and a potential solution for which I have worked for 35 years, completely remaining focused on finding early, the disease early and trying to treat it early. Sorry okay. for that No, no, no problem. We're going to probably have to rush through two more questions and then be finished for the evening. So, Hi. Um, so we're the last part of what you were talking about. You were talking about a call to action. Um, and I'm not an oncologist. I'm not a doctor. Um, I haven't worked in the medical field for 35 years. I'm someone who has no tenure at all. I just started my career. But as a young person who's not versed well um, in the oncology field or even in research, because I've read parts of your book and I cannot comprehend them, what is something that I can do to solve both the personal call to action that you express in the book and as well as advance the societal call? So as young people, someone my age early in their career, what can I do? Very good question because there's lots of young people, my own grandnieces and nephews in the room. Uh, you know, the first sentence of my book is, I couldn't have written this book 30 years ago. Why? Because I needed to walk the walk. I needed to walk with my patients to their deaths every week for 30 years before I could say all this. What can you do as a young person? Educate yourselves, become aware, try to learn the what are the problems. Try to clearly identify what the issues are. That is what you can do. You can't get up as one young person and bring a big change overnight. But what you can do is start working towards it today. I'm so happy that you were here this evening and that you were. You just came up and said, I don't have any of these, uh, uh, these, uh, this experience behind me, but you are asking for us to lead you and guide you where to go. So your job is... Please become aware of what the society is doing around you. Become socially aware, socially conscious, politically active. But there is no substitute at all for serious uh, search for knowledge. You have to keep educating yourself. Read, read, read. Become aware of everything. Thank you. I'll see to Gulbi. <laughs> no, we can ask two we questions. We're going to ask questions please. together. That's okay. all right. Because yes. I think they're both valid questions. Um, so I'll start with mine. You talk about early detection. Um, you also talk about what it does to, to caregivers around you if you uh, know of somebody close to you that's been through cancer. So I'm somebody who's been through, I'm a caretaker, not cancer myself, three times. So there is a huge human cost to not only the person going through it, but to the to the caregiver, I feel. So my question to you is, you talk about early detection. I'm talking about prevention. What are your views on that? And I'll give you perspective. Is because my mother's been through cancer twice, and uh, she's still a survivor. Um, and I spoke to her oncologist, who's not here, she's in Canada. And she said to me, if you're done with your family, get it removed. And I said, but I've gone through the gene testing and everything, and her response is very similar to yours. They keep evolving, they keep changing, the research keeps changing. The answer to the question that you posed to me today may be a different answer two years from now, and then I will sit and think, damn, why didn't I tell this girl to do something about it? So, and I, I, uh, you may not have the answer, but I just want you to talk about early detection versus prevention. That's a very pertinent question. Again, I don't have the answer for, for it any better than what your oncologist already said. We don't know enough. We don't know what we should be doing, whether we should be advising women to get uh, uh, tested at birth or at 15 years of age or 30 years of age. We have no idea right now. We need proper research for it. So i sorry, I don't have a very... And we can't answer. wait for research. I mean, time may just yes. outlive the research. Time may just outlive me. Yes. Okay. And that's why we have no time to lose. 
And therefore, the next question is way more important, which is? No, so, Dr. Azra, you've been actually a very formidable voice, very articulate voice whenever I've seen you, you know, on poetry and this and that. So I was wondering, why did it take so long to, to write this book? I mean, uh, 35 years of, uh, <laughs> and the nervousness that you felt. Maybe just explain that a little bit, because in the book, there's a lot about how you actually thought about even considering a ghostwriter or not doing it yourself. Yes. Um, and that's seems unusual given uh, given that you have such a strong voice yeah. and what we as young people can do yes thank you well first of all I'm not a writer I'm a scientist and I'm an oncologist I never considered myself a writer uh, it was only uh, that I befriended John Brockman when I moved to New York and he is an agent for Andy Warhol and uh, Richard Dawkins and Steven Pinker and Daniel Dennett and I'm forever socializing with him and his wife. And one day, uh, he just came to my apartment uh, three years ago and said, Azra, you've been haranguing us with this for 10 years. <laughs> now, why don't you just write a book? I said, because I'm not a writer. I'm not going to write a book. But it's not uh, correct, uh, darling, to say that I have not been speaking up. I have, in fact, Freakonomics Radio, NPR, is re-airing my interview from six years ago this week nationally because to coincide with the book. I have been saying the exact same things. If you hear my interview on Freakonomics Radio, which was six years ago, it's exactly the same things. It isn't like I'm, I give grand rounds, tumor boards, I travel all over the country speaking at conferences and dinner lectures and morning talks and podcasts and television and everyone agrees with me, then they go home and do the same thing they've been doing. <laughs> so finally, this thing is just one more assault that I have <laughs> in my continuous, uh, 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 continuous battle for getting things changed. So I don't know if this will have any effect at all, uh, whether you'll all go home and forget about this and then everything will be the business as usual again. So but even if that happens, I'm not going to stop. Until I have a single breath in my left in my body, I'm going to continue to try to do what I think is the right thing to do because I took the Hippocratic Oath and I have to keep serving my patients. So I don't know what will come after the book, but I hope this will at least raise some awareness in the public mind. Okay, but you have to stop for tonight. So, <laughs> one more. Um, okay, one. Okay, 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 okay. She, she, she's a softie. She spoiled me all my life, so she's spoiling all of you tonight. Just one more question. One more, and then there is a signing. So, anybody that wants to speak with Dr. Raza afterwards will still have an opportunity. Okay, my question is um, when I was a graduate student, I lost a friend to ovarian cancer, but it was in the United Kingdom. And at some point, um, uh, there was a new medication on. I can't even remember what it was. But at some point in the, in the national health system, they rationed it. They obviously realized that there was no point in extending the medication in an unlimited form. And I remember when we were graduate students, it upset us terribly. I mean, she died about a week later, actually, when, the, when they closed off the medication. But I, that makes me think, do you think that there are other countries, and particularly in countries where there's socialized medicines, do they handle cancer care? differently, better, in a more humane way, in ways that are uh, better generally? No. And you know what's the problem? Is? Uh, the problem is that the entire world looks to the United States for leadership. Where is our sense of responsibility to the rest of the world? We are supposed to be providing uh, the guidelines for how to proceed. Is this the best we can do? So no, I don't think any country, whether it's nationalized care or not, is doing better. They're looking at all of us. We have to do better. Z, before we end, I never end without poetry. So one yes. very short poem and then we end. And again, Emily Dickinson. I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me. I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample, I could finish enmity. Nor had I time to love, but since some industry must be, this little toil of love I thought 
was large enough for me. Thank you so much.